Hey folks, David Stewart here. Let's talk a little bit about the mighty year 2007, what I call Gaming Ground Zero. This game came out in 2007. I have it in a box. All of that will be important as I dig into this little essay. If you're not seeing any video game footage, I figured I would do what I'm most comfortable with, which is turning on the camera and just talking to it. So you can imagine some video game footage from 2007. Chances are you've played a significant number of the games that I'm going to talk about. But I call it Gaming Ground Zero because 2007 was this huge peak in gaming. We got all of these great games. And especially if we broaden the window to include a little bit of 2006 and a little bit of 2008, we got a lot of really good games. But after that, you get basically a lot of repetition of what those games delivered in 2007. That is the engine of creativity in gaming in the West, at least in terms of major developers, because indies hadn't really become a big thing then. It just really ground to a halt in 2007. Now, a little bit of background to this. This is based on an idea of cultural ground zero that a couple of my friends uh, talk about often and have been talking about for years. I'm going to link an article down below by my friend Brian Niemeyer. Basically, the thesis of Cultural Ground Zero is in 1997, the wheels fell off of the cultural bus, so to speak. Uh, basically, Cultural Ground will halt in 1997 and stop progressing. This is why you don't really have aughts nostalgia. We should have aughts nostalgia, but we don't. Why? Because the aughts were the same as the teens, which are the same as now, which was the same as 1998. So basically, after 1997, the culture hasn't really been any different. You can only have nostalgia for things which are different. So all the nostalgia really exists for the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, not so much the aughts because they're the same. It's just kind of been the same gray culture ever since 1998. Movies, music, really hasn't been a whole lot of change since then. Now, there are, there are exceptions, obviously, but we're talking about the larger popular culture. That's pop culture, ground zero. Well, the video game industry really soldiered on for another 10 years, and then 2007 happened. And after 2007, we got the same thing in video games. So here's some games that came out in 2007. I think you can make a case that 2007 is one of the best years in gaming history. Here's some games that came out. Mass Effect... Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, World of Warcraft, The Burning Crusade, the first expansion for World of Warcraft, which was really huge at the time. And for most veteran players, the debate is whether Classic or Burning Crusade is the best version of the game. And certainly the best version of the rating game was probably Burning Crusade. Anyway, Crisis, Bioshock, Portal, Team Fortress 2, Assassin's Creed, The Witcher, Uncharted, Drake's Fortune, Unreal Tournament 3, Super Mario Galaxy, Lord of the Rings Online, Halo 3, God of War 2, Rock Band, Lost Odyssey, Overlord, Fire Emblem, Radiant Dawn, Crisis Core Final Fantasy 7, Big PSP Game, Metroid Prime 3, Legend of Zelda The Phantom Hourglass, Peggle even came out in 2007. And if you broaden the window a little bit, so you're including some games from late 2006 and early 2008, you also get The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, which was huge, Gears of War, Final Fantasy XII, uh, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, it, uh, you even have Far Cry 2, Fallout 3. Um, Persona 4, I think, came out during that period too. So did Little Big Planet. So you had a huge number of games come out between late 2006 and early 2008. And this lines up with um, the seventh generation of gaming consoles. That's going to be the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the Nintendo Wii. So lots of great games came out there. And not just great games, but games which became the foundation of the next generation of games and the next generation of games after that, apparently. So you had demos, like I mentioned Crisis here, which is very interesting that I have it in a box. A lot of people are like, a box PC game? Yeah, these were a thing in 2007 still. You could still go down to the store and get um, a PC game. You could still get them kind of here and there. I, in fact, I have game, uh, box games from like 2015 even, but... This one is from 2007, Crisis. This is basically a demo for CryEngine, just like Far Cry was. So you had the two biggest engines really become available for developers to use, and that was Gears of War and um, Unreal Tournament 3 using the Unreal Engine 3, 
or the Unreal 3 engine, whatever you want to call it, and Crisis, which you and Far Cry 2, which used the the Cry engine. And so those are the two big engines which would develop a huge number of games over the course of the next few years, including Mass Effect. Mass Effect well, and Mass Effect 2 were um, were both, I think. In fact, I'm yeah, I'm fairly certain that they were both um, Unreal. Unreal Engine 3 games. So you had the engines all debut with great games behind them that really displayed their graphic potential, their potential for um, varied and interesting gameplay. Well, what happened after that? After that, we started getting lots of sequels and we started getting lots of games that maybe were new, but really were just using the gameplay elements of games which came before them. Um, especially, say, Elder Scrolls for Oblivion or Far Cry 2. Now, think about all the Far Cry games. Are they really any different? After Far Cry 2, they're pretty much all the same open world amalgam of games. And so you get the same thing that happened after the 2007, which happened in 1997, which is the graying of the landscape. Um, rather than developing new and interesting games and seeing what's going to come out of them, you end up with a repetition of what's there. Call of Duty 4 is a really, really good example. And it's a really, really good example of what happened in 2006 to 2007. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare was a game which really like made a ton of money and created something that made consoles shooter friendly, right? Now, the first shooter I remember on consoles that people were really into was GoldenEye. But for people like me who played on PC, GoldenEye was a very subpar experience, and in fact, most shooters were, you know, you could play a shooter on the PS2, there was like, you know, 007 Nightfire, there was like Time Splitters and, and different, you know, there was different shooters on the PS2, but they weren't as good as PC shooters, that was always the feeling, was like, these things are better on, on the PC, they just are. Well, after Call of Duty 4, it became this exploding popularity that people played shooters on their consoles. We considered Call of Duty 4 a rather casual, a really casual shooter compared to, I don't know, Quake 3 or something like that. Um, but it was really big at the time, and because of its online, um, its online multiplayer, it became a huge phenomenon. This was a really big deal. It's hard to underrate just how important Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare was for the development of all of these game consoles, especially um, what people called the HD twins back then. It was play PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Because if you were playing Call of Duty 4 on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, you were buying a new game every single year. We've had a new Call of Duty game released at the end of the year every single year since then, and it's the same game. So you get people to pay $60 every year for the same game. In fact, you get them to pay a lot more than $60 because they pay $60 for the game and they maybe buy a map pack. They might buy the DLC for it, which was a thing that has come and gone. You have season passes, uh, different ways of selling people additional content for the exact same game. And I say it's the same game because it's the same gameplay. The gameplay of Call of Duty really has not altered itself in, at this point, like 14 years. It, it's basically been the exact same thing over and over and over and over again with different, you know, there's a different single player campaign. There's different skins, a little bit different look to things. The graphics get slightly better, uh, but not even that much better. Basically, it's been the same game ever since then. But you also have people paying for things like Xbox Live or PS Plus to have access to that online play. This is a big deal for consoles and everybody paid attention to it. So the seventh generation of game consoles launched as physical consoles and indeed uh, PCs were still physical media um, devices. My PC at the time, I, I felt like I needed a physical, <clears throat> an optical drive in order to install games. Now I have an optical drive and that's like I don't even use it. You know, why, what would you use it for? You get everything off of Steam. So yeah, we still had physical games even for the PC back then. But the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360 launched as physical platforms. They launched as physical um, consoles and then they transitioned into being digital consoles where you had to pay for online subscriptions. You put in a game and it immediately patched. You had day one DLC. All the stuff that people uh, detest about the gaming industry started in 2006 to 2007. The horse armor for Oblivion started in like 2007. The DLC for Oblivion started in 2007. All this stuff started in 2007 and then just 
has continued on since then. So they started as physical consoles and then they ended as digital consoles. Well, when they started as physical consoles, you still had the approach to releasing a game that was present on the PlayStation 2 and on the Xbox and on the GameCube, which was that a game when it shipped had to be complete because you weren't looking at online um, online consoles. Now they were online. Like the Dreamcast had a built-in modem. You could get a modem for your PlayStation 2 and play. You could even play Final Fantasy 11, I think, on your PlayStation 2. Wild to think about that. Um, I had a friend that did that. So PlayStation 2, though, was, was not an online console where you had to put in the disc and then it patched to a hard drive. It didn't even come with a hard drive. These were things you had to ship the, the, the game finished. So in a lot of ways, the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube, they were the last consoles. And the Xbox 360, you could even make a case that the Xbox is this case because it had a, had a hard drive and stuff. Um, but the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, those are the first digital consoles but really they're managed PC experiences from about 2008 on. So they started as a standard console where when you got the game, you put it in and it played. There's still a lot of games from that era like Heavenly Sword that uh, are physical only. Like you buy the game, you have to buy the game physically. You can't buy it off the PlayStation store. You put it in and it just plays. Uh, I have a lot of early PS3 games that that's the way that they work. They don't really require patches and some of them have patches but they're not even really necessary it's like a patch that fixes some random bug uh, you know it's not like a big thing nowadays when you when a game ships you have to wait for it to install like a 40 gigabyte patch of all the crap that got fixed after they shipped the game disc and if in the future those serv servers are shut down you put the game disc in your ps4 or whatever it just won't play because the servers aren't there it can't download the patch that makes it functional at all so totally different world after 2007 versus um, with 2007 and i think call of duty 4 single-handedly making the console like this we play online on xbox live we play these shooters kind of thing that's a big deal world of warcraft burning crusade came out in 2008 i mentioned the debate is what's the best is it classic or is it burning crusade that has always been the perpetual debate i think in terms of the end game of mmos the peak of all mmos is World of Warcraft Burning Crusade, the end game, that is the raiding game and the end game dungeons, end game PvP to some extent. Although I actually didn't really like uh, Burning Crusade PvP and I wasn't super interested in WoW PvP starting with arenas on because I played classes which weren't good in arenas initially um, and didn't really think that much about that. But certainly the in game rating was huge in Burning Crusade. You had more content than you've ever had in any other World of Warcraft expansion since then. And you had the classic gameplay expanded. You really pushed the original gameplay of classic to its limit. It was huge and it set the stage for 2008. You get the release of, at the end of 2008 at least, you get the release of the Wrath of the Lich King, which was the peak in terms of subscribers for World of Warcraft, but was also the beginning of the end for the gameplay of World of Warcraft. Because after that, what starts to happen is there begins a corporatization of the content that makes up World of Warcraft. And uh, you get things like the Dungeon Finder, then the Raid Finder later, uh, which make it easier to get into a group, but that lowers the ability of people to play the game at a higher level, which means the difficulty has gone down in World of Warcraft a lot since then. So the game, the majority of the game, like I know there's mythic raids and things like that, but the majority of the game is much easier than it used to be and in general has a less epic feeling than it had back um, during the Burning Crusade days. And certainly they haven't shipped with as much content as they used to have. So beginning with Wrath of Lich King, you have uh, the corporate push from Activision Blizzard. They merge and then you get basically a watering down of the game so that the, the gameplay becomes easier, more immediately gratifying, requiring less planning, requiring less uh, interaction with other players in order to, um, to maintain mastery over the game role. And, and it's a pretty big deal why Burning Crusade um, was very successful because after Burning Crusade, pretty much every MMO just was replicating WoW on some level, including, you know, even Asian MMOs, they bring them over like Aeon, they bring Aeon over. Uh, and the first thing that 
they do when they bring it to the West is like, well, we got to fill it full of quests and stuff because that's what Western players want. They want quests. There weren't that many quests in EverQuest, despite the name. Um, but after World of Warcraft, you had to have quests. So after that, all MMOs become this list of features. Like we have to have all these features in order to make our game be very, very successful. So we got to have like a, a, a battlegrounds. We've got to have, you know, dungeon finder. We've got to have instances. We've got to have um, this kind of PVP, factional PVP. We've got to have quests. We've got to have raids. We've got to have all this stuff. Um, and you know, the, the one that I bring out here, Warhammer Online, this came out in 2008 after getting Ground Zero. And you could tell it's a post Ground Zero game because they had it going into beta and then basically based on EA, once EA was, this was originally done by Funko, I think, or Mythic. I thought it was Funko, but anyway, EA was like, they sent it back into Alpha. And when it came back out, it was a WoW clone, quote WoW clone, that's what they called it. Now, WoW actually gets most of its gameplay stuff from like EverQuest, so it's it kind of indicates if someone calls something a WoW clone that they didn't really no MMOs prior to World of Warcraft. Um, but it came out basically with a big feature list of World of Warcraft. And people called it a WoW clone, even though all the, even the aesthetics, basically Warcraft as a world was a ripoff of Warhammer. Those of you who are fans of Warhammer will know this, but people who aren't won't know this. There's this rumor that Blizzard was trying to make a Warhammer game in the 90s and ended up just making their own IP, Warcraft, um, similar to it with orcs and humans. And anyway, so Warhammer Online came out. Basically, that's what you had. You had battlegrounds. You had these kind of class arrangements. You had quests. You had all this kind of stuff. It was a really good MMO, I think, for what it was. But it definitely was a feature copy of World of Warcraft. Now, this also starts to transcribe into other game modes where everything starts to move into um, what has been called the mud genre. And the mud genre, it's basically the mono genre that all these AAA games start to end up in this open world genre or open world sim or whatever they want to call it. And what this is, is a, a kind of game where there's no specific core gameplay element, right? If you're playing Final Fantasy 13. There's a core gameplay element to it. You know, it's these battles where you select these different modes of these characters and select different actions for them to do. There's core gameplay to that. And then you're walking through maps and experiencing a story. In an open world game, it's like, well, you walk around an open world, you pick up flowers off the ground because, you know, Oblivion had flowers. It's just a list of features from previous games that you just kind of amalgamate into one thing that doesn't really do anything well it just it just kind of exists and far most of the far cry games i think fall into this category and then you have games which start well outside that category moving into it so dragon age inquisition dragon age origins in 2009 is a very very good game to come after uh, gaming ground zero of course it was started development before gaming ground zero but it um by the time you get to dragon age inquisition which was a very bad game in my opinion and it was bad because it had no focus the core gameplay of the original which was this tactical combat with d20 a d20 system underpinning it had been replaced by walk around an open world now you it's not completely open you go between areas but walk around this world pick flowers maybe there's guys to fight do quests boy doesn't that sound familiar Walk around a world, do quests for NPCs, pick flowers. Where did they get... It's just a list. They're like, okay, well, we, we got to make this game modern. Let's have them pick flowers because you pick flowers in Skyrim and you pick, you pick flowers in uh, Oblivion. So we got to pick flowers in this game too. Let's have them... Um, you know what? We'll need to have you encounter random enemies. We got to have NPCs that give you quests, that give you things to do rather than Dragon Age Origins, which was going between areas where you had a specific goal in mind for each area. Um, it felt more like a dungeon crawl. It was just great compared to the just bland nothing of Dragon Age Inquisition. And even the D20 system that underpinned um, Dragon Age Origins and made it such an interesting thing to play on the meta level was just gone. So there's just no interest in Dragon Age Inquisition. And then the story itself was very blah as well. So... I look at that as like this is the what happens to a a quality game when you franchise it, corporatize it, and then put it into the 
um, the gray mixture of the mud genre. It just becomes muddied. There's no focus to it. It's not very good. You have games like Horizon Zero Dawn. It's just another open world game where you kill enemies and maybe pick up their weapons and maybe pick some flowers. Even uh, the mud genre version of of Zelda Breath of the Wild, you have that. Well, you kill the enemies and you pick up their weapons and you pick some flowers and you explore around an open world. It's like these games start to all resemble themselves. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Well, you explore around and fight random enemies. You know, so it starts to become a, a single genre. You notice this happened like at the end of the 90s with music. Everything starts to just kind of become this gray matter of alternative rock where everything sounds the same. Nothing really sounds that different. Even the vocalists sound somewhat interchangeable. You get the same thing in, um, in the mud genre as well. And including things like every game has to have dialogue wheels, romance options. You know, it's all copying Mass Effect. So if you go back and you look at 2007, you have these formative games that people just make sequels of and then copy the features of. And that's why a lot of games now just don't hold your interest the way they did back then, at least if they're from the West. There's still lots of great games coming out of Japan and uh, other countries in the East that I think do original things, but they're from a different culture. They're standing outside a lot of this. You also had, and I want to point this out because this wasn't in my original article on... Um, on Gaming Ground Zero and the mud genre and stuff like that. But there was a huge number of studio closures that happened in 2007, 2008, 2009 following this. I mean, we're talking dozens and dozens. The majority of game studios closed their doors after 2007. The question remains why, and I think there's a couple of reasons. The first one is they either uh, got bought out and then closed, or they had to close their doors because they could no longer really put out games, uh, at least HD games, in a quality enough to compete. Now, that is to say, HD development is more expensive than it was prior to that, and, you know, a little bit harder to do outside of the big corporate framework where you have a big budget. So lots of studios started getting bought out. You had uh, Blizzard and Activision merch. You had Bioware get bought out by EA. You had all of these things happen around 2007 or leading up to 2007 so that after that, game studios just started to get closed. You know, you had Dead Space, which is a game that came out in 2008. That studio, uh, which was Redwood, Redwood uh, was it Redwood Shores, that studio got closed, even though Dead Space was a very successful and uh, prominent game. The studio got closed because they weren't making FIFA. You know, they weren't uh, they weren't making Call of Duty Four, Modern Warfare. FIFA is basically the soccer version of Call of Duty franchise. It's the same game every year. You pay t for like updated rosters and you pay for your online access. So it's a very good relationship that developed between these mega these like mega game studios like EA and Activision and the console manufacturers who want to charge you extra money to play online and uh, want you to buy a game on their platform every single year for $60. So we fell into that. So uh, the big reasons I think is we had a conglomeration. All the studios started closing and getting bought out by a couple of big giants, Ubisoft, EA, and uh, Activision around that time. You had the switch to HD gaming, which increased costs. That put a lot of pressure on studios as well. And part of the corporatization of entertainment is that um, games stop being a creative exercise and start to become viewed as an investment return thing. And you're always going to, at least businesses and, you know, in capitalistic society, you're going to want to transition from things which are expose you to risk to things which are low risk, rents basically. You want to convert all of your risks into rents. So if you have a hit game like Mass Effect, what you want to do is you don't want to make another new game that's as good as Mass Effect. You want to make Mass Effect 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You want to keep making Mass Effect games because that's like a rent. Um, Call of Duty 4, you're basically paying a $60 rent every year to play the same game. It's it's not exactly rent, but you are closer. You're trying to move from a risk where I don't know if people are going to like this over to I just want to collect my money for my IP. It becomes an IP farm. So the corporate IP death cycle, which I've talked about in relation to movies and things, that's the same thing happens in games. It's been happening big time since 2007. 
If games explode like Assassin's Creed, you quickly move them from, okay, we took a risk developing a new game into, we're going to milk this until it's completely unprofitable, let it die for a couple of years, then we'll reboot it. We'll re reboot it with a couple of new games. That's exactly what is going to happen and what they're going to continue to do because it's no longer a creative enterprise. It's run by a large corporation that views the intellectual property as something to be exploited, to be um, to be used to generate uh, as much return on their investment for creating it and for purchasing it, for example, than, um, than they would get by making something new. So that's one of the things that happens. We see the same thing in movies. It's endless sequels. It's endless rehashes, remakes. Why are all the big movies remakes and sequels? It's because that's the easy money. That's the easy way to do it. Uh, you don't want to expose your company to risk. So there's a basic, um, there's a basic economic economic argument for why things um, actually end up that way. So that's my thing on gaming ground zero. Leave me your thoughts down below in the comments. 2007 was a big year. A lot of franchises started in 2007, but. Are we going to see new franchises? Will there be a renaissance? What's the counterexamples? There are definitely good games that came after 2007, even in the West. But one of the things that I think is a saving grace is that the indie market developed after this. So while the corporate hegemony, the large mega corporations like EA that make these mud genre games, while they have continued slogging off and not being creative for the last 14 years, independent studios have been very creative. Now they can't make games of the same production quality as Call of Duty because they don't have the resources, but they can make games with great gameplay. Gameplay doesn't require huge amounts of money. Good gameplay doesn't. Super Hexagon's a very simple game, but it's a very good game. So indie studios have really been the engine of creativity since then, and that's because they can take risk. That's because they don't have that much to lose because they don't, you know, they don't have this franchise which they have to keep going to try to generate return on, on income. And they're allowed to basically compete in the same space because of digital distribution. Digital distribution has a big upside is that even though yeah, we don't have our physical games anymore that we could just play off the disc. Like, you don't even have to patch this. This just plays. In fact, I should I should put it in and see if it still makes my computer cry. Um, but digital distribution makes it very cheap and easy for indie, indie developers to get their games into people's computers and onto their consoles in order to play and enjoy. In fact, the best-selling game of all time is an indie game made by one guy. That's Minecraft. Yes, Minecraft is the best-selling game of all time, in case you didn't know that, and it was made by Notch. It was just made by some guy, and it, the graphics aren't even good. They're big, blocky, ugly graphics that worked for what the game was designed to be. So it's not even a game with good, flashy graphics. All the flashy cinematic experiences that they try to do in the AAA studios, Minecraft blasts them all out of the water because it has good gameplay and enough graphics to present that gameplay in a way that people will enjoy. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and leave me your thoughts down below about this. And I will see you guys uh, next time.